Everyone's favorite late night show will be hitting a major milestone this year. SNL will be recognizing 40 years on the television screen since their first episode in 1975. SNL is the longest running sketch comedy show in history and has won 40 Emmy Awards, the most for any TV show. Joining me now is SNL alum and Iowa native Gary Kroger. Thank you so much for joining me, Gary. My pleasure. Anytime I get to talk about myself, that's a good day. <laughs> well, I guess my first question is, will you be tuning in to the 433-hour marathon on VH1 of no, SNL? No, I, I, as, as, as shallow as this sounds, I tune in to the residual checks that come in. I've seen them all. <laughs> I don't need to see them again. I mean, if I'm channel surfing and there's a show that I know, you know, of course I'll watch for a few seconds. But you know, uh, and the, the residual checks, uh, they cut in half every time a show plays. Mm -hmm. So I get checks that are literally six cents. It, it's not worth the paper, that, uh, the postage in the paper that it was printed on. But, but I enjoy the fact that people will say on Facebook, hey, I'm watching you right now. I don't feel compelled to go check out VH1 and see them, but it's like, it's fun. It's fun to know that they're out there again. Mm -hmm. Stepping back, what first got you interested in comedy and acting? Well, I grew up here in Cedar Falls, Iowa, uh, and I was uh, with the now uh, non-existent Northern University High School. Mm -hmm. We had an excellent uh, music and theater program there. The, the professors that we had were extraordinary. We were very lucky sort of lightning in a bottle in the 60s, 70s, and 80s in, in Cedar Falls, Iowa. And they got me interested in performing. I wouldn't say that I was specifically interested in comedy. I was interested in being an actor. I loved musical theater and had wonderful experiences. So I went to Northwestern University to really just be around other high school students that, are, that were considered of, um, that were the most ambitious. You know, there's other great schools for theater, but Northwestern is one of those that you only go there if you're truly am ambitious. You don't go there just, ah, I'll figure out what to do. No, you really want to be successful. And I was surrounded with people like Brad Hall, Julia Louis-Dreyfus, Paul Barras, people, Dana Olson, or Mike Spound that are very successful now. Um, Dermot Mulrooney, I mean, the list goes on. It, and Margaret in the old days, Warren Beatty, Charlton Hest, you know what I mean? The, the, the roster is big. So that drew me there, but I've always been a marginally funny guy. <laughs> you know, I was kind of a class clown, so comedy was something that I enjoyed. It was never a career to me. I got involved with people at Northwestern, like Brad and Julia, who were also serious actors who took comedy very seriously. Comedy was when it was necessary, it wasn't an end in itself to us. We liked social commentary. We liked theater that meant something. And if humor was the way to get you to pay attention, then great. So we did theater shows. We formed a guerrilla company called the Practical Theater Company. We operated in and around Northwestern, and we did shows. They were often received fairly well, but we were smart. We took the best scenes, the best sketches from every show, and after a few years, we called it the Golden 50th Anniversary Jubilee. So we knew it was just the good stuff. And we put on a show right next door to Second City. It was subsidized by Second City, in fact. And it was called the Golden 50th Anniversary Jubilee. And it was a huge hit in Chicago. This was 1982. Such a big hit that it caught the attention of Saturday Night Live. We didn't know they were in the audience, the producers. We had no idea. It was just another show. I remember uh, back then, I was in my early 20s thinking, well, maybe I'll get a commercial out of this. Maybe I'll get a Steak and Shake commercial or something, make a few dollars, I could take my girlfriend out to dinner, put some gas in my car. That was my goal. And they call us the next day and said, would you be willing, could you be in New York in a week and start the new season of Saturday Night Live? It felt like winning the lottery. I mean, I can't begin to tell you. I was driving down Lakeshore Drive with Julia and we were on our way to our last show and we were just giddy, screaming school kids that this was happening. Now, that's the best part of the story. The reality of getting there is it's a very competitive environment. Um, it's not the friendly participation, you know, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine environment. Outside of our own clique, which was me, Paul, Brad, and Julia, um, we made friends, but these friends, you're getting in the way of their airtime. So, 
It was very difficult. I guess comedy writer Megan Wright describes you as an engaged supporting player of charm and versatility <laughs> who buzzed steadily, although quietly, until the end of his three season stint. Looking back, would you do anything differently? Well, boy, those are the nicest words ever written. In fact, <laughs> when I die, if those could please be transcribed onto my tombstone, that would be super. Um, um, yes, I would do things differently. I wouldn't be... Uh, that's a really good question, and perhaps I should be talking to my analyst about <laughs> this. I wouldn't become a, a, a meaner guy, a tougher guy. I wouldn't sharpen my claws. I wouldn't grow fangs. I wouldn't be aggressive. I really took a lot of pride in the fact that I was an Iowa boy with Iowa values and I was a nice guy. Now that allowed me to be taken advantage mm -hmm. of or taken for granted. And, but I wouldn't change that. What I would change, knowing what I know now, is that I would have been more aggressive creatively. I didn't know how to sit in that writer's room or how to present my material, how to, you know, how to develop my material, how to develop things for me. I just didn't have those skills. And no one at Saturday Night Live at that time really nurtured a young comedic actor into doing that. But knowing that now, if I could go back in time, yes, I know the hours I need to spend, the people I need to talk to, the, 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 the arms I need to twist maybe just a little bit in order to maximize the experience. Hindsight is always twenty twenty. Hindsight is twenty twenty, And again, I wish, you know, I have, I have better creative skills now. You know, life gives you those things. Um, I found it difficult to compete with the best comedy writers on the planet Earth. I hadn't developed that skill, you know? It was very difficult. I had Eddie Murphy, good heavens, Joe Piscopo, then Billy Crystal, Marty Short, Chris Guest. These people are brilliant. And I was trying to find, I was in awe of their brilliance, you know, and trying to find my way. Well, now I know what I offer, what I can do. I've developed those skills and I wouldn't be intimidated anymore. That's the main difference. Intimidation doesn't do you any good at all. Respect is wonderful, awe, fine, but it doesn't help you to be intimidated. You know, there's no reason to go into anything, whether it's this side of the camera, that side of the camera, and feel intimidated. You need to know that you have the gifts, the skills, the motivation, the drive, and believe in yourself. How have you seen comedy evolve since your time on SNL? Another great question. I, I call my era the cartoon era. We liked broader characters, more obvious um, writing. Um, Gumby, buckwheat. I mean, these, these, these are, you know, it was, a, it was a little bit broader. We were, we were the first reflection, I think, of Monty Python, where we were playing with absurdity. Steve Martin's career was still huge. We were playing with absurdity, but we were drawing very broad strokes to make our point. Now, and I believe, because I watch my own son create comedy, he's more subtle, he's more real. You have so many avenues now to create things. YouTube gives everybody access to writing little films and little comedy films. The aggregate information that you're getting, the skills that you're developing, are honing your craft so quickly that I see more subtle comedy, I see more realistic comedy. Um, I find, like, like, you know, Will, Will Ferrell is as funny as a human being can get. But the reason we find him so funny is we find those shades of reality that he illuminates so well in just a moment. Uh, the silliness that we all have, but he plays it. He's so real behind his eyes that that's what we're relating to. That's the new standard to me, is playing it real, but understanding how ludicrous, ludicrous reality can be and giving that to people, uh, that's, that's where it's going. It's, it's, it's tending toward reality, which I really find fascinating. Do you see that kind of reflected in TV shows like yeah. Modern Family? Absolutely, great example. Now, yes, it's, it's, it's high concept, it's a little bit camp, but the reason we enjoy it so much is they bring all of these real human dynamics together in this, this cacophony of craziness. But again, it's the real things that we see reflected that are the most meaningful and funniest. Maybe hit 
too close to home sometimes. Too close to, I don't know that there <laughs> is too close to home. And in fact, where comedy is going is getting closer and closer to home. I mean, I don't know what's on the other side. Maybe we're, we're back to police dramas again. I don't know. But yes, it's getting closer and closer to that edge. Um, but I'm fascinated by it. You describe yourself as a actor, writer, TV host, MC, voiceover actor, and now I understand you're possibly looking to add politician okay. to the All list. Right. Well, you know, again, it's, it's my Iowa roots. When I went, when I was, I was in show business for 25 years, and that means Chicago, New York, and LA. I was never this guy to say, well, I'm just gonna do movies, and I'm not, no, I just wanted to work. I just wanted to work, and I didn't wanna shut off any thing that I enjoyed. I love to write. I love to write jokes. I love to write sketches. I've written TV pilots and things like that. I love to act. I like to do comedy. I love doing game shows. I was hired as a game show host a few times and I loved it. Now most actors wouldn't say that's what I want to do and they might say well that's going to destroy your career. No, I loved it. My job was to play games and hand people money. That's a good job. I like being able to do lots of things. And as an adult now, you know, as a father, living back in this community and away from show business, I like to be as involved in the community as I can. I like to MC events. I like to raise money for charities. I like to be involved. I like to help students. And all of that is connected to politics. I've been writing a column for The Courier for a couple of years. I write a, a, a blog that's a political blog. And people are interested in what I have to say because they can see that I'm serious, that I, I, I like to do research. Ultimately, I'm just trying to move the needle in, t in two ways, to have a good life and to provide for my kids and, and, and all that I can do to help any community. You, you want to leave this place a little better than maybe you got it. And, you know, I, I, I just feel motivated every day to think, okay, I, I don't expect to change the world, but it's like it's a wonderful life. You, 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 if, if you can move one person, if, if you or you had a good experience today and it causes this ripple effect towards something better towards your careers, then, then that's, that's my motivation. That's all we can hope for. Well, that's all we can hope for. Yeah. You know, uh, again, yeah, it is interesting. I do describe myself as all of those things, but that's simply because I enjoy doing all of those things. I would feel very incomplete if I had to cut something out. I have one last question for you, and it might be the hardest one that you'll have to answer okay. today. Right. Okay, prep yourself. Okay. Top three comedy actors, living or dead? Um, well, you know, I said one right now, mm -hmm. and honestly, I put Will Ferrell in the pantheon of great, because he can be in a bad movie and I will go see it. He can be in a bad movie that I see and I'll still watch it over and over and over because I find him so funny. You know, um, I put Will Ferrell there. He, he brought something brand new to comedy that I hadn't realized before. The greatest comedian that ever lived did not consider himself a comedian. It was Charlie Chaplin. And now I know that's old black and white soundless stuff for the most part. And that might be like, you know, m might be meaningless to a young audience. Do yourself the favor, go to the public library, YouTube, whatever you have to do, Charlie Chaplin, watch his full length films. They are pathos, they are comedy, they are genius of, of understanding the human condition. And, and the way he physically um, manifests life in a way to entertain you. There's never, ever, ever been a genius like Chaplin. I would put Laurel and Hardy up there, you know, Stan Laurel up there, but that's really going back. In terms of modern, the most pivotal comedian in my life was Steve Martin. Because here I am a guy looking for my way, and here's a guy that just decide, said, I am willing to be a clown, I'm willing to shave half of my face, put an arrow in my head, you know, and, and we had never seen comedy taken that far and that silly before. So yeah, Chaplin, Steve Martin and yes, Will Ferrell. That's a pretty that's a pretty good list. And pretty diverse yeah. too, yeah. you must say. You hit a lot of stuff there. Well, thank you so much My for pleasure. joining me, Gary. Yep. Uh, for more Cedar Valley news, like our Facebook page. Until next time, I'm Jeannie Edson.